G'day guys and welcome back to the Back Pocket Plug Up Podcast. It is your host Cade McDonald and I've rotated this the structure, rotated the roster this week. Uh, once upon a kind of time is under the pump with uni. Uni on the uni break. I cannot <laughs> believe it, but um, he is out and we've got a very, very good man in the seat. Josie, how are you, mate? <laughs> yeah, doing very well. Appreciate the call up, me a uh, second cap on the on the Cade McDonald channel, and I know how it feels being a, a uni student myself to be under the pump with uni. And Rogers is in the pits right now with uni work, so poor fella. But I'm happy to sub in substitution on the court, and here I am ready to <laughs> chat some footy shit with the big man. It is quite funny to be honest. Um, me and Rog <laughs> last week were sort of patting ourselves on the back because I'd had a large uh, weekend and um, he had a similarly large weekend and it was the buy round and there wasn't much footy and we sort of had a bit of a chat over inbox and said maybe maybe podcast get a buy and we put <laughs> ourselves through and it sort of it did look like we were, it, you could question our uh, our commitment. But we put ourselves through it and it was a good story. But now that he hasn't popped up in the second week, the week after that, it doesn't look too good on the resume, but he is under the pump. But, um, Drewsy, you've got your own footy show, the Drew mm. Footy Show. Um, so I thought there's no better man to bring me along. Uh, how are you feeling about being on the pod? Yeah, no, nah, happy days. I'm ready to go. I filmed me uh, Drew Footy Show today on my channel. So that'll be out on Tuesday. And uh, I do adjust the tips on the True Footy YouTube channel as well. So I'm uh, I'm greased up for footy knowledge this round. And I'm, I'm ready to chat some some football to the, the Cade McDonald army. Beautiful. Well, let's fire it away. I'm going to kick things off with the headline. Now, usually Roger does the headlines. He's, <laughs> quite, he's quite good on them. I've gone for some firm alliteration here. And I've, I've <laughs> it's, it's probably cost me points in the headline game. But my headline is... Gary's goal gives group grunt. How do you like that one? I mean, it's not quite a once a kind of time, Rogers. One. <laughs> I, think, I think we need to sub you out. Me and Roger run the show from now on. I thought you would have fit Geelong in there, being a G. Nah, G. Well, so it, w- it was going to be Gary's goal gives Geelong grunt. Uh, that actually does flow well. Yeah. It does flow well, to be honest. I just felt like the, the group, Gary's group, um, I thought that had a bit more ping off the tongue, but the Cats on Friday night, have delivered again, as they always do. And it's quite funny, Drews. Um, you know, uh, we, we chat footy. We chat footy we every now and again. And I was saying to you that, like, oh, West Coast, they, they don't seem as strong. And they seem to be, obviously, you're a freer man. They seem to be their rivalry. And we were talking about the D's, a uh, little rivalry that I have with the Cats. And it was the start of the season, and we're watching a game. It was West Coast and Geelong. And we're both talking, going, geez, the Cats are no good. Like... They should be 0-4. It's round five, and they're getting absolutely done in this first term yeah. by the West Coast Eagles. About 45 goals later, <laughs> and some more rounds to play, they are now Fermi as one of the best teams in the comp. How do you see Friday's game? Yeah, well, Geelong are a weird one, because they've won games so narrowly this year. Like You look at that game against Hawthorne, like bottle off the table, Hawthorne just about. Um, scraping a very unconvincing win past Gold Coast. Uh, that game against Brisbane, they really shouldn't have won that, given that Zach Bailey pinned Blitzarves holding the ball. So they've got all these points on the board. But Geelong <laughs> just always find a way to do that. And at the end of the season, yeah. it, it doesn't matter how you get the points, as long as they stack <laughs> up and have you in a solid position for finals. Um, but they've showed up in every big game this year, Geelong. They've gone to Port. They've beaten Port away. Um, they've Obviously, they've beaten the Bulldogs on the weekend, who have been one of the most informed teams in the comp, and they absolutely pumped the Premiers as well. So, um, yeah. yeah, this is just another statement win for Geelong, um, and they're, they're building nicely towards a flag this year, I think. Um, Tom Stewart, by the way, he is probably one of the best defenders in the AFL at the moment. Any time the ball come near him, he just dealt with it. Um, so, yeah, absolute hero down the back. That probably won them the game in the end. Yeah, Tommy Stewart, he put on an absolute clinic. It was... It, it was probably the most Geelong... Like, if I had to sum up Geelong, I would say over the last, like, four years, yeah. that's the sort of game that I would sum them up with. Like, it wasn't going their way, um, and it looked like someone was going to beat them. It looked like they were on the back foot, and any time they look like they're on the back foot, they get it done. I remember middle of last year during COVID, I reckon the Bulldogs were up by about 40 points at quarter time against them, and I reckon Geelong won that game. So it's one of those ones where 
if you see a Geelong game and they're losing by 20 and it's halfway through the third, you probably just may as well put money on them. Yeah. They just come back. They do, uh, they do whatever it takes to get over the line. And it was just super, super impressive. And they're starting to... Well, you know, oh, I'm never in this position in a season, but as a person who's supporting number one on the ladder <laughs> and seeing the Cats close the gap, it's starting to really make me nervous because they look like a genuine threat. They're going to be in the mix for sure. Um, <laughs> I, the thing is against the Bulldogs, because the first half was sort of so slow, Geelong like to play real like contested sort of footy. Um, mm. It just didn't seem like they got out of out of third or fourth. Like, I still think they have another gear to go. You look at that game against Richmond mm. in that second half, they were, that was, that was the Geelong <laughs> we know and love. That fourth quarter against Port Adelaide. Like, if Geelong can play that for four quarters, um, that's scary stuff. But it usually takes them a while to crack the opponent to find a way through. The Bulldogs nearly won this. Uh, who was it that kicked the goal? It was Toby McLean uh, just to put the Bulldogs ahead in that last quarter. Mm. And I, I just knew Geelong would find a way. They always do. They went forward yeah. once. They had so many numbers <laughs> forward after parking the bus. Um, yeah. And yeah, they, they stream forward. <laughs> Cam Guthrie wins a 50-50. Isaac Smith hits up, hits up a, a Gazza Rowan. And I thought he bellied like, it. I thought he bellied that set shot oh, as well. I know. I thought that was going like right off the boot. I thought that was going to hit Lammies on the roof. It was going <laughs> absurd angles and then just pinged back. And um he said he meant it. He said he was kicking them right to left from that pocket during the week. And that pocket is notoriously a left to right pocket. Like that's right. one of those ones where like you'll see highlights. That there's highlights galore of like danger running hard into that pocket. I think Josh Bruce did it earlier in, in the game, but running hard to that boundary. And it looks like it's going like skinny and narrow, but yeah. it just follows through. So it was quite weird for him to hang it out and bring it back from that pocket. But um yeah, no, it, and it is quite odd to get a bit of a read on the Cats. Like, y you can trust them. Like, uh, There's teams who I can't trust yet in the top four. I can't trust Melbourne in the top four. <laughs> um, just, like, just yet. I, I can't trust the Bulldogs just yet in the top four. But at Geelong and probably the Lions are two teams that I, I can trust. So yeah. I know that the Cats will be there when push comes to shove, but they, they have had some inconsistent sort of unconvincing performances but they do get over the line they just so always find that way it doesn't matter they do always find a way so it yeah it, it's yeah, we're not quite looking at them as dominant as probably what we should yet but you just know that when they're there at the end of the year they have that trust to be able to win a final win a couple of finals and have a real tilt at it yeah i predicted them to win the the flag in my pre-season predictions but what did you make of, of the Bulldogs? Because they've come up against the Ds, they've fallen short, they've come up against yep. Richmond, fallen short, and now Geelong. They're sort of like the Brisbane Good of point. two years ago, maybe. You know, they're they're yeah. developing into a top four side and we know they're gonna be there for a while, most likely. Um, but maybe just don't have that maybe it's just a big forward that they're missing because Norton, uh, I'm not huge on him, I'm, I won't get into that. But um, he, <laughs> he 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 was taken out of the game. Um, not that they had any problems kicking goals, but there's just something maybe missing to take the Bulldogs from a top four side to a genuine A1 side in the comp. So, what do you reckon? Well, it, it, it's crazy. Um, the midfield is like a bit OP. Mm. It, it's just, it's super, super stacked. But the forward line is lacking a tiny bit. But I personally think that their defence lacks a little bit. Um, yeah. I had a great debate at the pub with one of my uh, Bulldog supporting mates and <clears throat> I was saying who, who who are you more scared of lining up like when, you, when you're going down to full forward are you worried about a May or a Lever or are you worried about a Zane Cordy and Alex Keith <laughs> and now these guys work really well together obviously Bailey Williams gives them a bit of a chop out um, so they do have a pretty good back line but it, it's not an a grade back line like if their back line was as good as their midfield then i think we're talking about a serious premiership threat but i think the dogs probably have the skills to attack enough to probably be up there in contention but defensively they lack just a smidgen for mine yeah no i agree another couple trade periods maybe they can get in some big targets in their forward and back line and may and a ben brown and, um, yeah, that, that, they'll be firing on all cylinders, I reckon. But, yeah, disappointing for the dogs. But I don't put the dogs just yet in the power bracket. Like, I, like the powers... The pretender bracket. Against, <laughs> yeah, the powers losses against 
the, the big couple of sides have really uh, had me sort of question them as contenders. I don't have that question about the Bulldogs just yet. But, geez, I think they verse the Ds again. I think they verse a couple of these sides. So there are time for the dogs to get it together. But, yeah, just a bit of a watch for mine. Yeah, you were talking about Port Adelaide there. They played Gold Coast on Saturday, first game of that day. Robbie yeah. Robbie Gray playing in his 250th. Happy days, does his knee. So Yeah, I saw um, our man, the pair, on Twitter. He got the hashtag... 250 shades <laughs> yes. of grey trending global and trending that's Anthony. unreal that's, I saw, that's um, my boy I saw Port Adelaide like the genuine like the club mm. was any any Robbie Gray content they were hashtagging it I didn't actually see this game to be honest but yeah Robbie Gray out and I'm pretty sure it's lengthy as mm. well so he's done a his left knee medially I've just done my right MCL so I think it I think it's something similar in that department but he's going under yeah. for surgery so he could be out for up two, three months, if not more. I think it's similar time frame to Mitchie Duncan. Um, yeah. So that's two two genuine teams in, in the top four or five that have lost some real A-grade talent, mm-hmm. um, which will be really interesting. But a- another game for the Gold Coast Suns where if this was Rod, you'd be sinking the boots in. And I'm not someone who's prepared to do that. But when is this football club <laughs> oh. going, going to start showing something like I, I got a little bit of hope for them start of the year I think they knocked off the swans and then the pies and then maybe like a hawks or someone in between all that but it was like a pretty good run of form and I'm looking at them going look they're not a top eight side for me yet but geez look at the talent the the Rails, the Andersons the Kings Lacocious Rankin like they're starting to develop and I know they're all quite young um, especially in footy terms but when they were pinching wins earlier in the season, it was it was sort of like the world's their oyster. Mm-hmm. But now they just seem a bit stuck in the mud again. How, how have you seen them? They've just been an absolute blue balls this season, Gold Coast. Like, <laughs> yeah. They, on- yeah. they honestly have. I mean, it's embarrassing <laughs> at this point. If It doesn't matter what side you are. If you're an established, great club like the Geelong Cats or an up-and-coming side like the Gold Coast Suns, if, it, if you have Port Adelaide come to your home ground and you're only kicking two goals in the first half on a sunny day, mm. you're, you're taking the biscuit at that point. That That's just not on. Um, I, I don't know if we go into goals behind and out on the falls, but they're my out on the fall, Caden. I'll, I'll put that there for you, <laughs> all right? Because this is an absolute joke. Stewie Jew, I mean, he, he's commanding this army of, of the Suns. They've got no spark. There's there's no brightness there. They're more like moons than Suns at the moment. Mm. Um, mm. But Stewie Jew, I mean, he's been there for four years now, and it, it's going to be a long... Uh, it's going to be a work in progress, but... Yeah, it's it's easy to look at it as at the scale of the last like ten years or however long they've been around with no success, no top eight. But it's just getting frustrating at this point because it doesn't seem like they have twenty two on the park each week that are going to buy into the Gold Coast project because every couple yeah. seasons they take a huge hit with someone going back to Victoria. So yeah, yeah it it does raise questions of whether they'll ever be good, um, and I don't know if they will. Well, it, it gets a little bit worrying. <clears throat> when history repeats itself a little bit. So um, I, I think like your yeah, Mays, Lynch's, uh, Prestia's, those sort of blokes, Dixon's that left, I think they walked away with like a 30% winning record. And you sort of flush them out, start again, get the group in that you want to sort of <clears throat> restart that rebuild again. And now it's sort of a similar pattern. I'm pretty sure within 30 or 40 games, all their new talent has that similar sort of losing mentality and that losing um, momentum. And then that makes it hard. It it makes it really hard because uh, I think winning creates winning. And if you've seen teams who haven't won for 10 years, it takes them two or three years to really learn how to win together. So it's a little bit worrying for them. And I like the Gold Coast Suns as like a team. Like I know everyone sort of shops them around to be the team to go to Tassie and, (laughs) and, and whatnot, but I... I like him. Yeah. I like him as a as a footy team. So I I don't think draft picks help. I I think it's sort of at a time where they've they've had their draft picks, um, and they've got a good core group. I think it's now land a big fish time for him. Yeah. So no, that'll be really interesting over the next couple of years. I agree. They've definitely got to land big fishes and. Uh, Ellis from Richmond going there a couple of years ago was a good start, but that was a good start. The the players that are 
leading these sides are like your two Camillas. He, I think he's about twenty five. Like Greenwood, yeah, uh, Lukosius, Noah Anderson. Like they, these kids don't really have a clue how to build a club culture. They have yep. all the talent on the planet, and if you chuck them in another side, they'd absolutely thrive. But they're just dragging up all of these other players that are just yeah not showing up. And really, realistically, could you name twenty two Gold Coast players? Uh, nah, not at all. Yeah, not at all. And those names, like, I, I don't actually. I'm gonna butcher this name. Who was that bloke? Oh, Butterick. Those names, like, a couple of years ago, like Butterick's and um, those sort of types that were seemed like they were developing quite well. And now I just don't see them. Yeah, I, I don't even know if he's on the list, but he won a Rising Star nomination. So there was blokes like that popping up for them, who I don't know if they're injured or whether they're stagnating in their career, but um, they, they're at a sort of dodgy little period where it's got to get right and it's got to get right in the next sort of year like they got to start making like knocking on the door of the eight they don't yeah. have to make the eight but they got to finish the 10th or 11th and win your seven or eight games and um start to develop so hopefully that happens sooner rather than later but a side that <laughs> is sort of in a similar boat and we seem to talk about a lot on the back pocket plugger podcast is the carlton football club mm. and it, it's just getting so bad for them. It's getting worse and worse. Roggie sent me a text and said, don't hold back on Carlton. <laughs> and I feel sorry for all the listeners who have, to li- um, who have to listen to us talk about the Blues every week. But they've genuinely been a talking point. They were meant to make finals this year. They talked a big game. I'm pretty sure it must be documented somewhere. Or maybe I wasn't too brave enough to say it. But I remember speaking to you, Drew, yep. in the off-season. And I said... There's a lot of yes. There's a lot of like um, spark and spunk about the Carlton Footy Club, but I felt like last year was um, a really good year for them in terms of a young side who were pinching games because quarters were twenty percent shorter. Mm, yeah, <laughs> like they were in games for longer. I think if you took twenty percent off games this season, they'd. Be, they they wouldn't be four and whatever they are or five and nine or whatever. I think they would have won a couple more games because they can be in games for the half or the three quarters, but yeah. they can't finish them off, and they're getting found out a little bit. So, um, yeah, I did watch this game. I was a few tins deep, but <laughs> I just couldn't believe how easy it seemed for GWS at times. <laughs> Big Finlayson up forward was just having like it looked like he was playing Razzie's footy. Like he was just having fun yeah. out there. Um, the only time where Colton really looked threatening was that third quarter. And it was like, they, they stopped playing with fear. Like, it looks like they're holding back a lot of the time and they're just not willing to take the game on. There was that play where Zach Williams run through about three or four defenders and put it mm. to the top of the goal square and they, they got a goal from that. They kicked four straight in that third quarter. And it's like, all right, well, this is what we know Colton can do if they apply themselves, if they if they don't play with fear. But then GWS sort of kicked two more goals and it just puts it just out of reach <laughs> and they just fucking fold over and give up, pack up the chairs and yeah. go home. And it's it's really hard to see. David Teague admitted um, in the media, he said, we're in a real pit right now. Like this is a, mm. th- These are dark times. When you're the leader of your club saying that, it, it must be pit city. It's starting to get real hairy down there um, because it's now or never. <laughs> like, yeah. What, what, uh, another coach comes in? I, I think... Who else can come in? <laughs> it's not well, It's not an issue with the coach. Yeah. I, I don't think it's Teague. I mean, I, I don't I think, think I'll have that good of a list, yeah. to be honest. No, but I remember like a couple of years ago, there was articles galore on their 21s and below. And Nathan Brown brought out an article saying like 10 or 11 of these blokes could be all Australians. So there was... That sort of buzz around your O'Briens and your Fishers and um, all these sort of kids who, uh, I, I don't know, it, it is getting, yeah, a, a little bit worrying. I, I sort of view them as, and this isn't going to spark much um, excitement, but I sort of view them when um, when the Saints got rid of like an Alan Richardson, when it was sort of like oh, the rebuild happened and then they got, the new coach before the next step, and that's yeah. not a great, that's not a great example because obviously Saints have gone backwards this year. I'm trying to think of like that team that got the new coach, sort of, so that they weathered weathered the rebuild, and then a coach came in and they went up straight away. Can't quite name one, yeah, but no, um, it does sort of seem like you know if a Buckley or someone walked in, they've got the foundation set. 
we think, like I'm prepared to give them benefit of the doubt with the list. So we think they've got the foundation set. Like if you've got Weedering up one end, Mackay up the other, Sam Walsh in the middle, you've got you've got a call yeah, the there spines somewhat. There. Um, so, yeah. Uh, but I don't know. They're, they're having like genuine like reviews. They have Adelaide this week. If, oh, if they I don't, don't win this. I tip that game. I would tip the Crows. Um, but if they don't win this, it will be World War Three. Like, all hell will break loose. <laughs> I'll tell you what will prevent World War Three, and it happens every year. Carlton will show off at Optus and kick a goal with two minutes left and break my heart. Because <laughs> that game is fixtured in two weeks, and it's just in time for Carlton to come back into form and think that they're the best team in the comp by winning with such a late goal. Um, and I'm ready for it. So, Jeez, um, that's... <sighs> Even that fixture for the Blues, like a Crows and a Freo, none of those are easy when at the start of the year, they'd probably look at that and pencil in two wins. So it's just, it's getting really, really dodgy for them. Well, the Um, the most comfortable win Carlton had this season was against Freo. Like that was Freo's worst game of the season. Yeah. Carlton showed up at Marvel and just pulled our pants down. That was the most frustrating or one of the most frustrating results as a Freo fan this season. So yep. we'll see. Obviously, they've beaten us twice in a row at Optus. Freo are playing decent footy at the moment. Carlton aren't. Mm. So it's just going to be a direct comparison from where they were at the start of the season where they beat Freo. They were competing with sides like um, Collingwood early days. They, they just lost, but Collingwood are a good side. Well, that's a whole separate point. But they were competing yep. for like three quarters and then just fizzling out. Um, mm. And then they, they beat the sides that they were supposed to. Now they're just not getting any results. So we'll see when they come to Perth if they how much they've uh, decreased compared to Frio. Because, yeah, it's just a measuring stick from where they were a couple months back. It's also funny how, like, as the season unfolds, your expectations and your goalposts move for each side. Like, Adelaide, I remember Kane Corns saying that they wouldn't win a game. Uh, worst Adelaide list he's, at, he's seen in their existence. <laughs> And now they're going into the game against Carlton, who were tipped to make finals. And if Adelaide lose this game against Carlton, that's probably one that got away. Yeah. Like, this, is a, this is a game where Adelaide should pinch. <laughs> well, you know better than anyone that Adelaide are, are not an easy side to beat. Like, they show up. Um, they don't give up that side. They play with a lot of heart. Um, you saw it against that in that game against St. Kilda. They were, what, like 30 points down, 40 points down? Mm. Come back and won it. So uh, a side like Carlton, who give in pretty easily coming up against a side like Adelaide who, yeah, just don't give up for four quarters. It's it's going to be a tough game for Carlton to win this. If they do yeah. win it, uh, props for them, but they should be winning it. So it's not going to, let's not overreact, yeah. but um, they need a result. I don't know who to tip in this game. I said on the uh, Jesse's video, I said I'll tip Carlton, uh, but yeah, I'll, that might change. Jeez, well, I hope they win. Otherwise, Rogie's going to come in. Absolutely depressed <laughs> <laughs> on Monday. So after his hell. uni, after his intensive uni unit, and have lost to the in, Crows. In, <laughs> intensive uni. Uh, he, we've just come out of lockdown, and he's been in lockdown the last week doing uni essentially. So, um, oh geez, if the Blues could just win one for that bloke, that would be that would be nice. Um, how do you see the North Lions game? Because once again, to be fair to North. They've had one win for the season, but they're playing, I think, and at times this season they haven't, and they've deserved every whack they've copped. But um, whenever I've seen them, they'll be in it for three quarters, and I think it's really, really encouraging, and they didn't get absolutely blown out by 50 points in this game. Um, I I thought North were pretty good against the Lions. They held up well defensively against the side with so much um, power in that forward line. I think North are... A constant four to six out of ten. They just don't deviate from that mm. because they they haven't really shown a performance that's like all right. They are they are absolutely garbage except for the one against the Bulldogs, obviously. But they're competitive each week. Um, yeah. And they yeah they played three quarters against the Lions and yeah they um, ended up losing in the end. But most teams lose to Brisbane, so it's not a it's not a knock on them. They're playing Gold Coast down in Tassie next week, and I'll be tipping North Melbourne. Um, yeah. So yeah, yeah um, North Melbourne, yeah. Uh, yeah, play with a lot of intensity. I don't mind the ruse um, as as yeah. a bottom side. They they're not an easy beat. You'll beat them, but they'll they'll give you a good contest. Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, they're one of those sides where like you pencil it in that you're gonna flog them because you saw what Western Bulldogs did to them, and then it gets to like halfway through the third when you verse the the ruse and you start going, geez, they're sort of up 
they're up by ten here. Yeah, or they're, you know they're only down by a kick here. The Roos, and it it does start to creep in. Oh no, is this going to be their day? Um, and then what happens with like a lot of young young teams is like you can outrun them and and sort of uh, you know with the maturity. Yeah, just sort of uh, overrun them in the end, which is sort of what happened on the weekend. But, yeah, they're not a side that... Um, I don't look at the Roos and see that there's no hope there yet. I, no. I look at them and go, geez, I, I'm quite optimistic um, Yeah, by, by their list. They're probably in the same boat that Adelaide was last year. Like, I, I, could, yeah. I could see them next year doing what Adelaide have done this year. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, in that game in particular, though, there's a young Lions player who I'm starting to really froth. Um, he sort of, I, I, I watch every draft every year just because I, I find it so fascinating and I, I find it fascinating because I like watching the draft live and knowing only a handful of the players, but then I re-watch, I'm a bit of a loser, I re-watch <laughs> the drafts in a couple of years and now you know them. Yeah. So like I'll, I'll watch it live and see like a Mitch Georgiatis Go, like get talked about going to the D's and then he goes to Port and it sort of means nothing at the time and then three years later when Mitch Georgiatis is a gun and I rewatch it back and they're saying, oh, he could be at the D's. I go, oh, geez, he'd be Andy at the D's now. Um, but Devin Robinson was someone who he didn't get picked on the first night in the top 20 and every club, every man and their dog were trying to upgrade their picks to get that first pick the following night and I think it was pick 20 or pick 21. Yeah. To get him, and everyone was just shocked that he wasn't taken on the first night. So I've been sort of watching him with that in mind. I just remember that happening on the night, and he gives me Zach Bailey vibes in terms of young player playing at the Lions who is holding up their end of the bargain. Mm. Like he's coming in and um, he's very very serviceable, and I thought he played super well on the weekend against the Roos. I didn't see him in particular against the Roos. I was in and out of that game, but he's been going to the best midfielders each week as well. Um, yeah, like yeah. <clears throat> I can't really remember who because I'm I'm very good at what I do and I don't know what I'm talking about ninety percent of the time. But no, he um, yeah, he's been playing <laughs> on the on the best midfielders each week, which is yeah. I think he's only 21, 22. He's going to be learning yep. so much, and he's filled in the boots of Lockie Neal and um, Rayner as they've been out. Um, yeah, stepped up to the plate. Yeah, he's someone that really excites me. Him and Zach Bailey down there. I think, um, yeah, and it's quite funny because uh, the Lions, who are in the premiership window and have been for a couple of years, have like 18, 19-year-olds like that that are coming through. So it's sort of stocking them up for the future to come. It's exciting. I think what they're doing is great. Now, Druzy, it would be um, it would be criminal for me to get you on the pod and not talk about the Dockers. I'll start with uh, one of... Uh, uh, some trade news to be honest I'll start with one of my favourite players from the Dockers team and then we'll talk about the Dockers in general for a handful of minutes Uh, but Adam Chera he is an absolute star an absolute beast of a midfielder kick goal of the century against the D's (laughs) up in Cairns Um, just a genuine brute midfielder uh, just about to come into his prime and it's that middle of the year period where the come home factor starts sort of leaking into the news outlets. There's a lot of talk about him potentially coming home. Um, and then on the on the other shoe, there's some talks down here at the uh, down here at Eastern Beach, down here at Geelong, that a talent like Geordie Clark could be pinging back the other way. So I just want to ask you how you're feeling about the sort of the trade chatter that's happening at your club at the moment. I genuinely think Adam Chera hasn't made up his mind on where he's going yet. Um, yeah. He got drafted with Andy Brayshaw. They're genuinely best mates. I mean, he, he's a pivotal part of Frio's future. So I yeah. just think he needs to... Well, I know he'd know that, but whether he believes that he can win a flag at Frio or not, uh, yeah, I think that's going to be the, the defining factor. But, I mean, ever, ever since <laughs> he got drafted, he got drafted uh, pick five, I believe... Or maybe it was pick three. It was it was a top five pick. Brayshaw went second. Chera came after. And I was just yeah. like, all right, Brayshaw, we know what a Brayshaw does. He's a bull. He's going to dig the ball out of the bottom of the pack and shovel it out. Um, gritty mid. But from day one, I've always said Adam Chera is like my favorite player. Ever since he's been drafted, he's so silky. Like yeah. that game against Gold Coast, I had so many just angles of him, how he uses the ball. It's not just good kicks that he doesn't turn over. It completely opens up the play. 
he he thinks three steps ahead, Adam Chera. Um, and Freo have never really had a a real sil- silky inside mid. Oh, David Mundy, obviously, but I don't know. He yeah. he's the closest thing Freo have ever had to a Scott Pendlebury type player. Um, so yeah, for him to leave, it would genuinely break my heart more than anything. Um, as for the rumors, the rumors in particular, it's um, well, there's going to be heaps of rumors galore. Um, yeah, I- until he does sign, but. What I've seen um, is like Carlton are popping up and teams like that. You want to play for Carlton? <laughs> well, yeah, I can't see why he would leave a Freo for a Carlton in terms of like where they're sitting on the ladder. Maybe like go home factor. Obviously, that makes a little bit more sense. But um, yeah, I'm not hearing like massive, massive clubs having a crack at him. Necessarily, the only trade that makes sense in my mind. Jordy Clark's a good player, but you'd have to give up more than Jordy Clark to to get Chera over there. Because as I yes, said, he's a yes. Good. So yeah. the only one that has made me think like hmm, maybe is is Sh- <laughs> Shy Bolton back to WA. We send oh. Chera that way. Yes, because Shy absolutely. Bolton is an electrifying superstar <laughs> of the competition, and I mean, yeah, if you want to. A fair trade. Give us a pick and Shy Bolton <laughs> and you can have Chera. But, yeah. again, I'd rather have Chera at the end of the day. But ever since he's been at Frio, it's it's almost seemed like he has wanted to go home. I remember when he got drafted, like his parents didn't look too stoked. Yeah, no, yeah. so Chera was someone who I think needed coercing to uh, go home. So in recent drafts, Bailey Smith has said... Um, before he got drafted, that he probably doesn't want to leave the state. And then Archie Perkins in the last draft said, yeah, look, I don't want to leave the state. Yeah. And when they were mentioning those blokes, Adam Chera's name got brought up. So I believe if I'm putting the puzzle pieces together, he was sort of someone a little bit reluctant to go into state. Um, And obviously it's worked out fine. Like I think that's something that um, it it is really tough because in that sort of situation, it's like, at what point is it draft manipulation? Yeah. Um, so I do understand from a point of view of like, I'm an 18-year-old kid, I'm leaving school, my mates are weighing up whether they study abroad, whether they travel, I'm weighing up whether I, you know, <laughs> live in Queensland and go to the Lions or stay down here. So I, I understand it from that point of view, but then I do understand it from once you enter into the draft, just like the Goblet of Fire, um, <laughs> you get, if you get picked, you got to go sort of thing. Yeah. Um, because otherwise managers could just tell their client to say, look, I'm going to get homesick and come home, so don't pick me, and then sort of manip- manipulate their way to certain clubs in a way. Yeah. Um, but yeah, he had a bit of the, yeah, the don't want to leave interstate sort of mindset. I would love to ask him about how that feels now, whether yeah. that's something that he's gone, fuck, that was the best decision in my life to actually go through with it. Um, because I could imagine it, being that, like, what a challenge to leave interstate, go to, um, yeah, go to somewhere foreign. You'd just be learning so much. I, yeah. I just think it'd be unreal. But, um, yes, Adam Chera. Oh, Jordy Clark in particular, he, he's one that caught my eye straight away when he got drafted to yeah. the Cats. He is so exciting. It gives me, like, uh, some frustrating feeling <laughs> that Jordy Clark and Charlie Constable cannot play for the Cats. It's, like it's crook, hey, it's unreal. It's so fr- they are so good. They are so good. And maybe I'm missing something. Like maybe Charlie Constable plays and butchers the footy, or doesn't man up, or you know, maybe there's something intricate that I'm not picking up because I don't know much about footy. And maybe Cats fans will comment in the comments below and say, "Oh, look, nah, they're they're good, but they're not quite up for it." But Charlie Constable, whenever he plays, seems to get 20, 25 touches. Geordie Clark is an excitement machine. I know they've got, like, these tried and true older blokes um, who are pushing these younger blokes out, but I just look and go... I remember two years ago, Charlie Constable sort of semi... It seemed like there was groans and frustrations that he wasn't getting a game, and this was two years ago. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, Geordie Clark, I think if the Dockers could did land him. That would be a massive tick. He can almost play any position, Geordie Clark. He can play half yeah. back, back pocket, play on the wing, probably play inside, and he can play as that sort of like third tall, even a small forward role as well. So he's yeah, yeah. genuine talent. Um, you'd know plenty plenty of Geelong fans, but 
my uh, my poppy is a Geelong fan, and it drives him up the wall every week when Geordie Clark doesn't get selected. Because yeah, you, you think in like four or five years time, where are, where are all these Higgins and Smiths and um, Hawkins and Selwoods going to be? They're not going to be there at some point, and I think they've just put all their chips on the table this year, and they're forgetting about young Charlie and and Geordie sitting down in the VFL like. They, they need to bring him up. Um, I think they'd be stupid not to. Uh, but yeah, I'd take Geordie Clark at Frio any day of the week. So if you are feeling homesick, come, come. But you're not having chair for him. <laughs> <laughs> uh, nah, I rate that. Um, let's move on to the Bombers. Obviously, I made a bit of a boo-boo in my season protection. <laughs> yeah, so did I. I had them being bang average at best. Because I just I, I looked at them over the last three or four years. The Bombers have had the same Groundhog Day season for about five seasons in a row. It has been religiously flex that you're going to play finals, be below average during the year, and not make the eight. And I'm like, you can't sit in the middle of the pack for too long before you start not getting picks and sort of getting in a bit of trouble. Yeah. Um. And then, obviously, they had a bit of a clean-out. So, I'm looking at the Bombers going, well, you weren't great last year. You've now lost Orazio, Saad, Danaher. So, you can't be better. I just, I, I'm just, i sorry. I, I look at your squad. You've lost three of your best players. You can't be then better the next season. And then I saw all the youth coming in. And I'm like, well, the youth looks great. But it, it like oh, I'm a massive fan of like Nicholas Cox, Harrison Jones, Archie, Archie Perkins. Massive, massive fan. But I just can't see... Um, that clicking straight away, obviously, because of their younger bodies. So I see them going down for a bit. They, they've they sort of had a, a year similar to what they've done in the past, but injected youth. Yeah. So it's like, it's exciting now. So it's not like a stagnant year where it's like, we want to be pl- you know making the eight with your Danahers and um, Fantasias and whatnot. We want to be making the eight, but we're plateauing and um, not going anywhere. It's like, you've got this new list... Who are having a similar year to the year before, but it the the ceiling's so much more higher now. It's just super exciting. And um, a game against the Hawks that they lost at the start of the year, and they should have won. They should have won round one against them. So that's another win to their list potentially that could have happened. But yeah, a game against the Hawks, both similar on the ladder, um, to get it done down in Launceston, I thought was really impressive. Yeah, I'll take my hat off to Essendon. I put them at sixteenth uh, in my season predictions. I believe. I, I'm sold on Essendon now, though. Um, yeah. uh, after seeing that Dyson Heffel team talk after the loss to yes, Sydney, yes. he, he sold me. I mean... Yeah, he did. The, yeah. the club culture that they're building there, it just seems to... It seems like excitement's brewing. And I could definitely see Essendon making the eight in the next few years. Um, yeah, as you it's talked about... It's probably the best oh, Essendon no. culture I've seen in ages. I remember in the early 2000s, they had this... Um, Sort of aura of arrogance. Yeah. And this is me growing up as a kid, um, just picking things up. But I just remember they had this aura of arrogance and it was... Uh, like, I remember hearing stories that they wouldn't sign autographs down at the footy or, like, your, your, your herdies and lordos and stuff were really reluctant to engage with the fans. And uh, it was just this um, sort of... I don't know, this sort of... Yeah, this arrogance around the club. And then, obviously, they went through what they went through in the early 2010s. But it's just a a breath of fresh air at the moment. It's the best culture I've seen them have in... And as you you said, they've they've cleared out the dead wood and they've got value back in. So those three players that they've got in the draft, Nick Cox, man, he's one of my favourite players to watch in the AFL. I went to Dreamtime at Optus and I was just like, all right, I'm going to keep an eye on him. I've heard he's good. And he, he just wowed me. Like he is just an absolute yeah. athletic specimen. Not many body types like that in the AFL. Um, and yeah, yeah. He, he's going to be an unreal player. And the recruiting they've done as well to get Nick Hind, a player that I'd never yeah, heard of point. before. Like the, I don't know if you saw the goal he kicked against Hawthorne yesterday, but just yeah. he's so quick. And to kick that goal from fifty after yeah evading a defender, kicking a goal from fifty. He's probably one of the fastest players off the block in the AFL, and he's just mm. slotted into that Essendon side seamlessly. It looks like he's been playing there for six or seven years. 
Um, so yeah, no, big ups to Essendon. They've had a very good season. They've beaten West Coast over here. They took it up to Richmond in a in a good game in dream time. And yeah, as you said, Hawthorne, who they disappointingly lost to early in the season, they've they've had a good scrap against them down in Tassie, tough conditions. Jake Stringer shows up for his once every two month game where he, the package <laughs> arrives and he goes absolutely bananas, kicks four yep. goals and has twenty nine touches. But yeah, no, I'm I'm uh, I think Essendon will build. They obviously need some big signings down back or big draft picks, whatever. But um, no, I'm huge, huge on Essendon for the future. Yeah. Yeah, Harrison Jones is probably my man down there. Um, I find him so exciting. You, you can tell if a young forward is going to be good or not pretty early. Well, they can show signs. Like, obviously, yeah. there's players like a Jack Darling, um, Tomahawk, who took years and years to develop. I'd probably put the weed in that category. We can tell he's going to be okay, but he takes time to develop um, and time to sort of find their feet. But Harrison Jones, if you're clunking them at that sort of frame and that sort of age... Um, that's just a massive tick. Like, you don't have to be kicking your goals yet. <laughs> you don't have to be a superstar. But you were taking contested marks and you still got size to put on. So, yeah, Harrison Jones is is super, super exciting. They have the Ds this week. So, it's... It's going to be a tough match for you. They've taken top eight scalps. This is a big test for them. And it's a bit of a free hit because they're in a better position than what I think a lot of people thought they would be this year. Um and they've had some great performances. So it's not like a Carlton where, geez, they almost got to take a scalp to show something. It's like if they if they lose to the Ds but take it up to them, it's really, really impressive. And if they pip the win, uh, which they're, they're every chance to, finals isn't out of the realms of possibility this year. But obviously we don't want to go too far ahead of ourselves Definitely with the Bombers. Not. But they're, um, yeah, they're tracking along nicely. Um, I reckon we get into the goals behinds and outs on the full and I reckon we try and ping through them semi quickly. We're sort of at the 43, 45 minute mark, so let's we'll um let's get it. We'll we'll rip through these and and bounce. I'm gonna start with my out on the full. I believe we got yours earlier. Yeah. Um but we'll touch on it again. But my out on the full, obviously, uh well this will be a quick little uh, little out on the full is the blues. Yeah. Um <laughs> it, it's starting to get it's starting to get Sort of uh, break glass in case of emergency time. <laughs> I I still feel like uh, I know a lot of blue supporters. I still feel like it's sort of stick fat. Um, uh, yeah, they have the internal review or the external review, whatever it's called. So change is coming, and there's a lot of uh, urgency around that change. So you do have to stick fat as a as a supporter, but as a club, that's my out in the fall. It's been out in the fall. Yeah, I, I mean, I mentioned mine before. Gold Coast, 10 years of absolutely nothing. Have Port <laughs> come to their home ground on a su- sunny Saturday afternoon and they kick two <laughs> goals and a half. So, yeah. absolutely stinky from the Gold Coast. Am I out in the fall this week? Um, do you want to fire off your behind? My behind, I found it a bit tricky first time of asking, but I was happy. Off the boot, it looked all right. Robbie Gray, 250th. Happy days. That That's going through. That's going through. That's sailing through for a goal. Deviates yep. a bit to the left. Goes through for a behind. He does his knee and he's out for up to th- three months or more. So, um, <laughs> happy days. 250. Good on you, Robbie Gray. But uh, it's a, a bit of a blow for him to not get the full six points. And, uh, yeah, he's done his knee. <laughs> yeah, that's... Yeah, that's... Um, <laughs> geez, life is precious. Life is fragile. And <laughs> <laughs> things can... Things can change in an instant. One second you're doing some kinetic lunges at the gym, <laughs> and the next second you're, you're out for a couple of weeks. But uh. hashtag, hashtag stick to the process. <laughs> um, <laughs> my behind is now Joel Sarwood. He is a fierce competitor. And he is sort of uh, the opinion on Joel Sarwood around the league is like loved, as in like Joel Sarwood cracking in, captain, love. But Joel Sarwood lifting the arm, sort of playing for some frees, doing some grubby acts is where he gets his cri- uh, critiques from. Yeah. And as a Geelong supporter, I don't care. Like, he can play however he wants every week. He's dying on the hill for the club. You love him. But yeah, some of the acts on the weekend, like, I think it was Zane Cordy under the pack and he starts doing a bit of the, the eye gouging and the roughing of the hair and the... Uh, it was just, to be honest, sort of... a bit of a grubby act yeah. and then this one I'm, I'm happy to put down as an accident 
Um, but he sort of, I can't remember, who, was it Bailey? Oh, no, Taylor Duray. He, he stands over him and then sort of walks over him with his studs on his shins. Mm. And it, it looks semi-forceful, and I'm happy to put that one down as an accident, but it drew a little bit of blood on Taylor Duray's shins. Just a couple of little acts on the Friday night where you go, that, that sort of stuff that does take away from his Wayne Harms diving knock-on that wins them the game. And obviously, internally, Cats fans are going... Who cares? He's a star. And obviously, internally, Chris Scott's going, what a legend. He won us the game. But it's like little acts that take away from such a brilliant Friday night, yeah. I thought. Yeah, so, just a little right. bit disappointing from my side. Yeah, you can you can put your head over the ball and go back with the flight. But when you're poking little Zane Cordy in the eye on the bottom of the pack, I think, yeah, questions have to start being asked. So, yeah. Not, not the best but look for the skipper. It's not a legacy definer, though. Um, no. He is a star. He's a ripping captain, and he's going to be the reason the Cats are going deep into September this season. Uh, I'll go into your goals. What's your goal for the week? What's your six-pointer? My goal is the Geelong Cats. I mean, they just always <laughs> find a way, Caden. They, um, yeah, another big side comes up against the Cats and fails mm. to beat them. I mean... As far as goals go this week, the Geelong Cats beating the Bulldogs after the siren. Gary Rowan wins them the game. We spoke about it earlier in the show, but you don't get more goal than that. Climbing up the ladder and just establishing yourself, staking your claim in the top four mm. and saying, we're here, boys. We're not going fucking anywhere. That's a big goal real, for me. Real defining little patch for them as well. They had Port at Port. They've had Bulldogs at GMHBA. Lions and next Lions week. at the Gabba. Ooh. That's three... Teams around them. That's three teams in the top five, um, top five, top six, and they just keep knocking them over. And it's getting more and more impressive the longer it goes on. And as I've said before, yeah, I, I don't know if we can trust the dogs yet. I don't know if we can trust the D's, but you can certainly trust the cats to be there and be there about. So it doesn't matter how the wins come. Uh, you know, they could win by a point for the rest of the year and look like the <laughs> yeah. most unconvincing team. You just know when it hits that springy time of year. Um, they can do what they do best. Exactly. Uh, my, my goals this week, Druzy, is Tazzy Footy. That was exciting. Yes. Uh, Lo- Launceston on a Sunday Arvo. Now, usually I am not a fan of chucking the Tazzy Footy on, obviously, because it's like a bloody North Melbourne versus GWS game, or it's <laughs> like it's just a bang average game of footy yeah. whenever there's Tazzy Footy. And then that's why you start going, oh, What's the game today? Oh, Launceston, 340. Oh, terrific. I'm probably not going to whack that one on. Yeah. But to have, like, a really good game of footy with two big Victorian clubs who draw a crowd anywhere, to be honest, I'm really impressed. Like, the Bombers sold out Optus Stadium, and then it's a Hawthorne game at Launceston, and they're selling that out as well. Bombers fans are coming out in their droves, to be fair. But, yeah, it was just exciting. It was a good game of footy. Um, it, it was two, you know, big sides, two sides who were similar on the ladder and it was just really impressive to see the Tassie faithful come out in their droves yeah what a game it was as well I mean that yeah. just sum, sums it all up Essendon they're, they're the bloody travelling circus at the moment in a good way <laughs> they're, they're, wherever they go they're, they're pulling a crowd and um, yeah they're playing well but yeah Tassie footy they just need a team down there they just do need yeah. a team they just need yeah. to be the stoke of the AFL cold windy night down in Tassie who's going to beat a yeah. team down there when they when they can adapt to the conditions and establish a strong home claim but um yeah no it was, it was good footy down in Tassie this weekend well what I was thinking just before we wrap it up is like ever because we were looking like everyone was watching the game going see Tasmanian crowds sell out you know the stadium and then I go but what if every Tassie person has a side already and they get no supporters. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, what if it's like, nah, Tassie, there's a hundred thousand football loving mad people down at Tassie and then Tassie get a team and like, no one goes for him because they I already go the for like, Richmond. And- <laughs> 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 yeah. Oh. So I was thinking that, but surely I think it would be one of those ones where it's like, I'm a D supporter, but I support like the Tassie boys. Like yeah. sort of get around them. Yeah, for I'd sure. I'd buy a membership. <laughs> like that, Dan. I would. I'd get around them. Um, well, I think that's all we got time for for the Back Pocket Plug Out Podcast. Druzy, thanks for joining me. Thanks for giving us a chop out, mate. Yeah, no, thank you for having me on. I've, uh, I've listened to many hours of the Caden McDonald podcast through thick and thin over the years, and um, I'm finally on one. So from fanboy to co-host, happy days. <laughs> Doesn't get much better than that. That's, um, 
I think Roger's the same. I think Roger's still the fanboy, to be yeah. fair. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, well, if Roger's, you know, doing some more uni, then uh, I'll be sure to get you on again. And obviously, you've got uh, a couple of footy shows on your channel. We'll link the channel down below. But do you want to give another shout-out to some of your footy shows that you've got flying around over there? Yeah, so Drew Footy Show every Tuesday at around 3 Vic time. I'm trying to get to 5K by the end of June, Caden, and it's fallen flat on its ass. So oh, I'm, really? I'm, about, I'm about 280 away. I reckon there's 280 people that have watched this. Absolutely there is. So there has to be. Uh, feel free to subscribe to my channel if you enjoy footy content. And uh, I would greatly appreciate it. Comment, um, cheese grater, if you come from this video. <laughs> 281. I reckon the Back Pocket Plugger Army, I actually don't know how strong they are. I don't know. You know, I've never tested them in this sort of instance. I've never tested them like this. This is what the Back Pocket Pluggers do, though. We roll the sleeves up. We help out our teammates. So um, I would love to see them get over and get you to 5K. I think that's something that the Back Pocket Pluggers have in their kit bag. Um, anyway, Drews, I appreciate you coming on, mate. Um, yeah, but, yeah. I, I appreciate you it. having me, mate. I, I appreciate you more. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's it from us at the Back Pocket Plugger Podcast. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you all very, very soon. Cheers. Bye.